blood pressure after the examination of pulse next step ex examination is blood pressure of the patient how do you measure the blood pressure the outpatient setting patient comes to the hospital and commonly you check the blood pressure in the sitting position but there are some precautions if a patient gets out of his car runs to meet the doctor if you check the blood pressure be high so patient must rest 10 to 15 minutes before you record the blood pressure if he has smoked soon before or if he has taken coffee soon before the recording it may be high if he has climbed the stairs and come to your office again it will be high so some precautions has to be taken and you take the blood pressure in the sitting position in the arm in patients in the ward commonly you take the blood pressure in the lying down position and if you are suspecting postural fall you make the patient stand up and record blood pressure within 3 minutes and see the drop if systolic blood pressure drops more than 20 and diastolic more than 10 you call it as orthostatic hypotension the causes of orthostatic hypertension is known to everybody h a n d i and d hypovolemia adrenal insufficiency different types of neuropathies drugs and idiopathy causes so whenever you find patient has symptoms suggestive of a fall during standing you immediately check the standing blood pressure and what about the lower limb lower limb blood pressure is commonly taken if the lower limb pulses are absent if you are suspecting quartesh of aorta or you are suspecting aortic regurgitation where you are looking for heel sign the common you go so this is the position the prone position you apply the cuff over the thigh and you auscultate over the popliteal fossa for the coracoidal coast sound that's how you are recording the blood pressure the lower limb alternatively you may apply over the cuff in which case you can palpate and take the palpatory blood pressure but here auscultation is not possible so when to take the blood pressure of the lower limb when to take blood pressure in the standing position, when to take in the sitting position, when to take in the lying position. Uh. Okay. Uh, okay. So, important precautions when you take the blood pressure. You may have mercury manometer or you may have aneroid meters like this. And this is applied 2.5 centimeters above the cubital fossa and center of the cuff must face the brachial artery and you encircle and start recording of the blood pressure. Common size of the blood pressure cough is 12.5 cm. With obese people up to 18 is available and for children smaller sizes are to be selected. When you check the lower limb blood pressure, the same apparatus, you are expected to get 20 millimeters higher blood pressure in the lower limb. If there is a symmetry of the pulse on the two sides, you have to check for blood pressure of the other limb also. Normal difference between the left upper limb and right upper limb is less than 10. Le left will be slightly more because of subclavian which comes directly from the aorta. More than 10 is always abnormal and you call this as an isosphygmia. So difference in the blood pressure between the two arms is very significant. In case of arterial disease arising from the aortic arch, Takayasu's disease, occlusion of blood vessels, you may find this asymmetry. People who have undergone Blalock shunt, again you may find there is pulse asymmetry. If there is embolism, again pulse asymmetry may be there. So all such situations, blood pressure of the two upper limbs must be recorded. Once you apply the apparatus, you inflate it and always check the palpatory method for systolic blood pressure. Then you increase the systolic blood pressure higher than the palpatory method and then auscultate. That is called auscultative technique. Sometimes the palpatory method may be showing higher reading and auscultative method may be showing lower reading. This is because of what is called auscultatory gap. To avoid that, always check the palpatory method then auscultatory method. The first sound you hear corresponds with the Korotko sound 1 and when it disappears you call it as Korotko sound 5. 
in aortic regurgitation the sound may not disappear then you put as zero so systolic bar zero if you are particular you can add in between when it is muffling for example 180 bar 60 bar zero that is also possible in certain circumstances whenever you check the blood pressure the patient is breathing slight drop in blood pressure during inspiration is expected as you already discussed the, during discussion of the pulse but if it is more than 10 drop you call it as pulses paradoxes so that is also possible and if you bring down the mercury column and suddenly the corrupto sound doubles that indicates pulses alternance when you find diastolic blood pressure is very high systolic blood pressure is normal that's always be taken very seriously and always look for secondary causes of hypertension on the other hand if the systolic blood pressure is very high diastolic is normal that means possibly the vessels are very inelastic as in it happens elderly and that may be the reason for isolated systolic hypertension let's go to the examination of jvp jv means jugular venous pulse it also means jugular venous pressure so we are examining the neck veins basically for jvp there are external jugular veins and internal jugular veins we commonly select internal jugular veins and external jugular veins are not selected now external jugular veins can be identified they start from the midpoint of the clavicle crosses the sternum arch and goes up on the other hand internal jugular vein is between the two heads of sternum astoid. from the point in between the two heads you draw a line to the angle of the jaw that is the surface marking of internal jugular vein external jugular vein is going through the fascia it can be kinked there are valves so we don't usually study external jugular vein commonly we look for internal jugular vein that too on the right side left internal jugular vein may be crossing the mediastinum other structures may be pressing on it so the best way to look for is the right internal jugular vein so which position can you look for internal jugular vein internal jugular vein can be looked at any position when the patient lies down you may be able to see jugular venous pulse that is normal that is normal so the reference point for the upper limit of jugular venous pulse is the manubrium so when you have a upper level you always look for the manubrium and if it is raised above the manubrium level then only you will say jvp is raised Ju internal jugular vein start from the cranium it's a continuation sigmoid sinus through the jugular foramen and sometimes when the jugular venous pressure is very high you may not find it at all it is higher up in the brain cranium in which situation the patient sits up or stands up it may become more prominent so there are certain maneuvers by which you can make it more prominent once you have selected right internal jugular vein and identified by the pattern now the question is is it an arterial pulse or a venous pulse so arterial pulse is carotid pulse so we have one side carotid pulse on the other hand we have venous pulse arterial pulse is very thrusting venous pulse not so so from a distance you can see number two arterial pulse just comes a wave venous pulse comes sinuous wave like venous pulse has got upper level like a manometer and it goes up and down carotid pulse has no upper level as you take deep breath the venous column comes down blood is drained to the heart right atria so the upper level comes down and arterial doesn't make a change when you make the patient sit up lie down and stand up venous column may move arterial column has no change at all so inspection wise this is how you differentiate between the two and by palpation what you do is you just palpate and see and carotid can be easily felt venous pulse is not commonly felt rarely in tricuspid regurgitation venous pulsation may be felt now you look for 
hepatic jugular reflux meaning thereby you press on the abdomen mid abdomen for 10 seconds and keep on looking at the jugular and if it is positive the jugular venous pulse will become very prominent as you take off your hand suddenly it drops this is called hepato jugular reflux previous concept was always press upon the liver that is not followed now you press anywhere in the abdomen if the pressure increase in the abdomen it is transmitted through inferior vena cava through the hepatic veins and then it is going to the atria so if this channel is patent hepatic reflux will take place but if there is inferior vena cava block the hepatic venous block then this may not be possible hepatic jugular reflux is not normal it indicates impending heart failure now question is correct so we take this position for measuring the jvp of this patient we have identified the jvp i am showing the left side commonly we do the right side for purpose of demonstration suppose this is the upper level of the jvp i will identifying it and put a scale or pen like this parallel to the bed the floor and from the mandibular sternal edge i will measuring how much the pressure is elevated that much centimeters is the raised jvp so commonest condition where you find raised jvp is a heart failure you may find raised jvp also in superior vena cava obstruction where it is not pulsatile engorged but not pulsatile you may find elevated jvp in pericardial diseases constrictive pericarditis or it may be even terminate pericardial effusion so once you have measured jvp next step is to look for waves why are looking for waves right atria have pressure changes according to cardiac cycle and right atria is direct communication with the jugular so that the pressure changes are always communicated transmitted to the jugular and we are studying the pressure changes according to cardiac cycle looking at the jvp so there are clinically visible four waves although laboratory wise there are five clinically we see two positive waves a and v two negative waves x descent and y descent how i do know it's a positive or negative wave positive waves always comes like this and negative wave always comes like this so positive comes like this negative comes like this so when i see a positive wave on the right carotid right jugular vein i put my right thumb on the left carotid and see what's the relationship between the carotid pulse and the wave that positive wave which comes in front ahead of the carotid pulse is the a wave and the positive wave comes with the v wave with the carotid is the v wave that's how we distinguish between two positive waves a and v sometimes both may be prominent a indicates atrial contraction it will be absent in case of atrial fibrillation atria contracts and blood goes to the right ventricle at any particular point of time because of resistance from the right side tricuspid stenosis pulmonary stenosis pulmonary hypertension a wave may become prominent also sometimes the atria contracts but because of arrhythmia ventricle is not accepting because the, the valve tricuspid valve is closed so whenever the atria contracts the pressure is transmitted to jugular and this type of waves are called as cannon waves as it is taking place in certain case of complete heart blocks or different types of arrhythmias so absence of a wave prominent a wave cannon waves they are all diagnostic in clinical medicine x descent means it is relaxing and it will be very prominent in heart failure patient that's a negative wave after the x descent you find the v wave when the atria is getting filled up v wave imagine a scenario where atria is accepting blood from the periphery and it is dilating simultaneously ventricle is contracting and instead of the blood going to the pulmonary artery because of the tricuspid valve or regurgitation or incompetence 
blood from the right atrium ventricle goes to right atria not only the atria is filling normally excess blood comes from the ventricle and you get a very giant v wave very prominent v wave so this is called cv wave and that's diagnostic of tricuspid regurgitation and then wide descent indicates the valve is opening blood is rapidly going down and this become very prominent in case of constrictive pericarditis so important points about jvp is proper identification we have to take the internal jugular vein what difference between external jugular vein and internal jugular vein why you are taking the right internal jugular vein what the difference between carotid and jugular venous pulse how to differentiate between them and then look for specifically for measuring the jvp from the mandibular sternal distance is the vertical distance from the mandibular sternum from the upper level of the jvp and then you are looking for specific pattern of waves a and v positive waves x and y negative waves so this how you are studying the jvp now summarizing you can see by just looking at the jvp you are able to diagnose congestive heart failure you are able to diagnose superior venous obstruction you are able to diagnose tricuspid regurgitation you are able to diagnose atrial fibrillation you are able to find out a group of conditions like pulmonary hypertension pulmonary stenosis tricuspid stenosis by looking at the airway you are able to find out cannon waves and arrhythmia complete heart block by checking at the airway and you can see the constrict pericarditis suddenly it comes down now when jugular venous pulse is raised ask the patient to sit up is to he sitting up i'm looking at the jugular venous pulse and you expect the pulse to come down take deep breath take deep breath slowly during inspiration spontaneous breathing itself the, the jvp comes down there are situations where instead of coming down jvp goes up this is called as kusmal sign kusmal sign is characteristically seen in pericardial tamponade constrictive pericarditis and so on different types of cardiomyopathy so kusmal sign is very important sign for us and that is best elicited in the sitting position nani tenne and if you are not able to see the jvp properly there's one more technique you make the patient stand up and you make the jugular venous pulse may become prominent alternatively the ear lobule ear lobule may be moving in case of venous pulsation carotid pulsation it will never move so by proper analysis of jvp always we can make out different conditions seven eight conditions you can diagnose by just observing the jvp jvp examination is always a nightmare for students but i try to simplify it as far as possible first you identify the j internal jugular vein differentiate from external jugular vein differentiate it from carotid you know how to measure it very simple technique then you know the raised or not then you know how to look for positive waves and negative waves conditions putting in positive waves and negative waves kusmal sign and that's it and jvp is made as simple as possible thank you